Good to see you. Sean Dell and I are just back from Rwanda a couple of days ago. And um, although I deeply wish that Pastor Rick was here this weekend, didn't have to go through what he's going through, glad to see from him earlier and hear from him and see how he's doing. I want to tell you, I, I was very enthused to get back from Rwanda and share this message with you. Because what we're going to talk about together these next few minutes, it is absolutely life-changing. It is the secret to true greatness. We're walking through what it means to see God's purposes be fulfilled in our lives through the church. God gave us the church as a place that you and I could learn and fulfill God's five purposes for our lives. We've been talking about worship. We've been talking about sharing. This weekend, we're going to talk about ministry, serving others, which is the secret to greatness. Serving is the secret to greatness. That's what Jesus taught us. In Matthew 23, 11, first verse in your outline. If you're here the first time in your program, there's an outline with some notes that go along with what we're going to talk about. Verses will also be up on the screen. And Jesus said in Matthew 23, 11, the greatest among you will be your servant. The greatest among you will be your servant. Now, the greatest servant who ever walked this earth was Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, I came, I'm the greatest person that ever lived, God in human flesh, and I want to model for you. I want to show you that there's nothing greater than serving. So in Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, for even the Son of Man, that's Jesus referring to himself, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was the greatest servant, and Jesus had the greatest impact. And he says to you and I, you want to have the greatest impact with your life? It comes through great service. This is true in any area of life. You don't have to be in church to realize how important it is to serve people. Any boss knows that if you're going to be a good boss, you've got to serve the people that work for you. Any business knows that if you're going to be a good business, you've got to serve the customer. Just a few quotes about that. For those of you who are thinking, hey, I'm like in business, I'm in the world, I don't know, this service thing, I don't really have time for it. You better make time for it because it really is the secret to greatness in any area of life. Inc. Magazine says, uh, the mission, you got to form the mission of your company around how your business will serve others. Harvard Business Review says, learn to be a servant leader. Forbes says, customer service is the new marketing. And by the way, this book that a lot of us are reading during this series, Purpose Driven Church, it's required reading in a lot of businesses. Why are businesses reading a book about the church? Because they want to learn to serve. And you, as a church, have been an example of service for many, many, many years. Any business that wants to be great knows it comes from serving. Any school that wants to be great knows that it starts with serving. Any community that wants to be great, any country that wants to be great, it starts with the way that we serve. But many of us have the wrong picture of a servant. And Jesus wants to clear that up. He wants to help us to understand what a servant really is. We picture a servant as somebody who is weak, who doesn't have anything else to do, who has a lot of time on their hands, or somebody with no vision or no energy, or even an unwilling servant. Listen, this is very important to understand. God tells us very clearly in the Bible, he does not want you to be a slave to anything or anyone. Jesus came to set us free. But he wants you to be a servant to everyone. Big difference between being a slave and being a servant. It's not unwilling, it's willing because you love. And so Jesus wants us to understand. He wants to show us what a servant looks like. And we're going to walk through an experience that Jesus had with his disciples the next few minutes where he pictures for them and for us what it means to serve, what a servant looks like. It's in a room above a house where Jesus and his disciples have gathered to eat a Passover meal together. The disciples don't know it, but Jesus knows the next day he's going to die on the cross. So it is their last supper together. And during this meal, Jesus does something that pictures for us what it means to serve, what it means to serve others, that you cannot serve others without being a servant. And in order to be a servant, there's some things you and I need to learn from Jesus. Now, as we walk through this, there's a feeling as you walk through these verses that you're there for one of the most significant moments in history. Something really important is happening here. This is a night that changed the life of the man's words that we're going to be reading, the Apostle John absolutely changed his life, what happens in this experience. And it can change my life. It can change your life as well. When you really understand the greatness of service, serving others, it absolutely transforms your life to begin to live out the fulfillment and the significance that you, you know you were made for. 
And Jesus teaches us how in this experience. So five things we're gonna learn from Jesus. Number one, what does it mean to be a servant? Number one, servants love. To be a servant is to love. Jesus deeply loved these disciples and that's why he served these disciples because he loved them. John 13, one, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love by serving them. When did Jesus best exemplify his love to his disciples? Not when he taught them, or not even when he did miracles, but when he served them. And he shows us here that ministry, it's all about motivation. It starts with motivation. It's motivated by love. If ministry isn't motivated by love, if it's motivated by fear or by guilt or by anything else, it's not gonna last and it's gonna wear you out inside. But when it's motivated by love, then all of a sudden you find the fulfillment that's meant out of ministry. So let's just talk about motivation honestly for a minute. Because here's Jesus, motivated by love. He's God in human flesh. He is perfectly and purely and continually motivated by love. How about you and I? Could any of you say, oh yeah, every moment of my life, I have been perfectly, purely, continually, in every decision, I have been motivated by love. Anybody that raises their hand, the people next to you are probably gonna hit you. They won't be motivated by love. (laughs) Because that's just not us. We're this mess of conflicting motivations. So I'm not like Jesus. Can I serve other people? The question isn't, are you perfect? Because we're human beings. The question is, are you growing in the motivation of love? Not are you perfect in it already? I won't even get there at the end of my life. Neither will you. But are you growing in the motivation of love? Because the more you're motivated by love, the more you're strengthened to serve. And the more you're strengthened to serve, the more you achieve what Jesus tells us is true greatness. So how do you grow in the motivation to love? I mean, where where do you find it? If you try to conjure it up somehow from within yourself, you're gonna find you're running on empty a lot of times. So the Bible tells us very clearly how you and I can continually fill our tank with this motivation of love. It's a verse that's up on the screen. In fact, let's read this verse together. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, read it with me. We love because he first loved us. So it starts with his love. That's where you get your tank filled. It starts with his love. Because he loves me, then I can love others. Don't try to start with your love, because you don't have enough. Some of us have more than others, no doubt about it. Some of you could go weeks, some of you could go years, some of you could go about five minutes on the amount of love that you have right now. Jesus says, when you look at God's love for you, how deeply he loves you, how unconditionally he loves you, and let that be the motivator of your love for other people, then you've got something that can keep you motivated the rest of your life. Knowing that he loves you, no matter what, gives you the freedom to love other people, no matter what. Knowing that he forgives you of any sin, gives you the freedom to forgive other people when they sin against you. In Galatians 5, 13, in the message paraphrase, it talks about that freedom that we have, the freedom to choose. That verse says it is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. God has given you and I the freedom to choose. I can choose to be selfish or I can choose to serve. I've got the freedom to make that choice every day. And Paul encourages us here in Galatians to make the choice to serve one another in love. You might circle that phrase. That's the secret to lasting ministry. You love the people that you're serving. Now, you may not always love what you're doing. I'll promise you, you won't always love what you're doing, but you love the people that you're serving. I don't know of any parent who would say, you know what I love most about parenting? Changing dirty diapers. I mean, that was the best part. I mean, really, I was so sorry when that was over. Nobody says that. But you changed the dirty diapers because you loved your kids. You loved the people that you're serving. It, it starts with motivation. You serve not because you're supposed to, or you have to, or you need to. You serve because you love. And the more you grow in that motivation, the more you're fulfilled with how you serve. So let God's love be the motivation of your love for others and just watch the greatness that that brings into your life. That's the first thing Jesus teaches us in this experience. Second thing is this. Servants know who they are. Servants know who they are. Along with a strong motivation, servants also have a strong sense of identity. 
And their serving grows out of the confidence that comes from knowing who they are. They're not serving trying to prove who they are or get other people to affirm who they are. They already know who they are. And out of that, they serve. Look at Jesus, John 13, three and four. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing and he wrapped a towel around his waist. He's about to serve the disciples. Now notice how Jesus served out of the security of knowing who he was. Those phrases, all things were under his power. So he knew he was in control, but he chose to serve. He got up from the meal. He could have chosen to do anything. All things were under his power, but he chose to serve. He knew that he came from God and that he was returning to God. And this is what enabled Jesus, knowing who he was, this is what enabled him to serve others at the moment of his greatest pressure. He knows he's going to the cross the next day. He knows what he's facing, but he's still serving the disciples. People who aren't confident of their identity, of God's love, and what it says to them about who they are, they don't make very good servants because they're always trying to prove themselves, get something from other people that lets them know, hey, I'm okay. Well, when, when you try to serve other people and you're hoping they'll respond back, letting you know that you're okay, we've all been disappointed by that one, haven't we? How many parents have thought, I'm gonna have a child just so they will affirm me? Any of you think that? That didn't work out too well, did it? This does not work. To serve well, you gotta listen well to what God says about you and let that develop your identity. And I found personally that Satan constantly attacks my identity, tries to make me insecure about who I am because then I'll focus on myself instead of looking around for the people who have needs and serving them. As we talk about this thing of identity, I think it's important to take just a minute to talk about the difference between being codependent and being a servant. Because they can actually look just the same on the outside. If you're codependent, being codependent, very short definition, is doing something for someone hoping that will make you feel better about yourself. It's putting another person in the God position in your life. They're the one who's gonna meet the needs of my life. And you can serve them when you feel that way, serve everybody in your life. You can look like the best servant in town. But on the inside, it's not because you have a strong identity, it's because you're trying to find an identity. It's entirely different than serving. Serving is starting with the strength that God loves me, that God meets my needs, and giving to others out of that strength. So when you talk about your identity, let's just get real practical about this. Who are you because of Jesus Christ? Some of you, you've never begun a relationship with Jesus Christ. So what I'm saying to you is, who could you be in Jesus Christ? What does God want to do to you, in you, for your life to transform you? Well, you look through the Bible and you see definition and explanation and clarification again and again and again about who we are in Jesus Christ. Who are you in Jesus Christ? God says, you're the light of the world. You're a child of God. You are Christ's friend. You can say, he's my best friend. You are chosen of God, you are adopted by God. You're an heir with Christ, that's who you are. You're God's dwelling place, you are God's workmanship. You are a victorious new creation. We could go on and on and on about who we are in Christ. We live in a day where there's a lot of identity theft. And spiritually, there's a lot of identity theft that's going on. Every day, Satan is trying to steal from you this sense of identity, your true identity of who you are in Christ. All he has to do is get you to listen to circumstances and what they say about you, or other people and what they say about you to steal your identity. But anytime you go back to listening to God and what he says about you, then you strengthen your identity. Then you become the kind of servant that God wants you to be. Servants know who they are. It's the third thing Jesus teaches us as we walk through what happened this night. He teaches us, this is the simple core issue of what service really is. Servants meet needs. That's what it means to serve. If I'm serving, it means I'm meeting somebody's need. That's at the core of ministry and service. Ministry is when I choose to meet a need in your life, when you choose to meet a need in my life. And Jesus met a need in the lives of the disciples that night. It was an obvious need. They all had dirty feet. It was one of the most obvious needs of that day because there were no 
paved roads or sidewalks. So you walked around on dirt all day. And when you came into the house, you had dirty feet. And unless somebody washed your feet, the house got filled with mud. So they'd prepared this Passover meal. Somebody had got the lamb, somebody had got all the place settings, somebody had gotten the wine and the glasses, and it was all set except this room that somebody had loaned to them, a servant didn't come with that room. So nobody was there to wash the disciples' feet as they walked in. They all had dirty feet. So they walk into the room and they start to play this game. Maybe you've played this game. It's the whose turn is it to serve game. You know what I'm talking about? That's the game where you go, okay, wait, I got the lamb, it's your turn to serve, you wash the feet. I, I set the table, it's your turn to serve, you, you, you wash the feet. I got the glasses, I got the wine, I, I did this, I did that, it's your turn to serve. Let me ask you a question. Do you see anything about turns in the Bible? Like love one another when it's your turn? Or serve one another when it's your turn? I don't see anything about turns. It's just love, it's just serve. But they're playing this game, this whose turn is it to serve game. And Jesus walks into the room, he sees this, and here's what he does. John 13, five. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So Jesus is scrubbing muddy, men's feet. That is not a good job. (laughs) Foot after foot after foot after foot. If I'm doing my math right, that's like 24 feet. There's 12 disciples. You can check that math later. He's scrubbing these feet again and again and again and again. He's meeting the need. God in human flesh washed dirty feet. He's showing us what ministry is all about. He's showing us that there's only one true kind of greatness, and it's the greatness of service. Now, why did Jesus wash their feet? Well, really two reasons. One, their hearts were proud. Second, their feet were dirty. Their hearts were proud. If they hadn't been prideful, one of them would have done it, but they didn't. They were all caught up in which one of them was the greatest. But he also washed their feet because there was a pressing need. Their feet were dirty. So you might write this in with me. What does it mean today to to wash feet? What is this a picture of? To wash feet is to act to meet someone's need. Now today, some churches do like a foot washing service. It's like a religious ceremony. It's a holy moment of expressing our fellowship to one another. It's, It's a very beautiful thing that's done in churches today. That's not what was happening here. This wasn't a religious ceremony. Everybody washed feet in that day when you walked into the room because the feet were dirty. There was a need, and Jesus met that need. That's ministry. That's ministry. I told you, Shondell and I are just back from Rwanda. It was a different trip for us this time because our kids, Andrew and Alyssa, uh, my daughter and son-in-law, are living in Rwanda now, along with our two grandkids. So we got to be with our grandkids and do ministry in the churches at the same time. It really was quite enjoyable, very, very enjoyable, being together and watching all that happen. We're going to churches usually during the afternoon and walking into churches and helping them to understand what it means to be purpose-driven and how their church can begin to be transformed. Walking in Rwanda, a lot of times you could walk on sidewalks, but in a number of places you're walking on the dirt like they did in that day. So my, my shoes got dirty. And Andrew, my son-in-law, noticed this, and he said, here, give me your shoes. Took them off and brings them back about half an hour later, and they're all shined up and ready to go. That's a simple expression of what was happening here. There was a need, somebody saw the need, and somebody met the need. You do something that somebody else needs. So if you have never served, the church is a place to begin to serve. This is like a practice ground where we get to serve each other so we can serve better in the world. That's why this weekend at all of our campuses, we have this simple list. It's on the regular connection card on the back side of 10 simple needs, a place to start. You think, I don't know which one I'd be best at. Well, just check one. If you're terrible at it, you'll find out and you'll try something different. It's not like you're stuck with it the rest of your life. You're just beginning. It's a beginning point. So I'd say for you, okay, Is there a need? You're thinking, I don't know what the needs are. Well, here are some needs. Would you be willing to just check a box and say, I'll help with that? 
It's the path to greatness, this simple choice to begin to meet a need. Now, I gotta explain something about ministry that's very important to understand. There are really, for all of us, two types of ministry that we need to be involved in. There's what I would call the ministry that's based on your shape, and then there's the ministry that's based on a pressing need. The ministry that's based on your shape is based on the way God has fashioned and formed you. You know at Saddleback we talk about S-H-A-P-E, spiritual gift, heart, abilities, personality, experiences. That those five things, when you look at them, you can see how God has formed you to uniquely have a ministry for the rest of your life that you're involved in. It, It may transform into this or to that, but it's gonna fit your shape the rest of your life. And every one of us needs a lifetime ministry that involves how God has gifted us and formed us. That's one part of ministry. But just as important is a second part, a ministry that's based on a pressing need that's right in front of me. And when I see a need, I realize I need to meet that need. Sometimes we get confused and think, well, okay, if, if shape is, what is my ministry, then if there's a pressing need, I can't do it if it's not in my shape. So you walk, you know, you're walking along the church and you see some trash on the ground and you think, well, I'm not really shaped to pick up trash, so I'll, I'll wait for somebody who's shaped to do that. No, the church is dirty. You're, you're here, you're part of the church, you pick up the trash, that's just what you do. Or you know a, a neighbor, an older neighbor, and they're having a hard time getting their trash container out every night. And you go by their house and say, hey, would you mind if I took your trash container out for you? That's a pressing need. Or even better, you say, would you mind if my kids took the trash container out for you? That'd be even better, wouldn't it? That'd be great. I'm I'm joking about that. But the truth is, there's nothing better than ministering together with your kids, helping your kids to get involved in ministry. I know a ton of people in our area who have said to me, we made a mistake. When our kids were young, we said that our ministry was serving our kids. But because all we did was serve our kids, our kids started to get pretty selfish. They didn't realize that we got to serve others. If I could do it again, I'd spend more time serving with my kids. So anytime you can make the choice to do that, you're building true greatness into their lives. Because Jesus said, service is the key to greatness. So servants meet needs. Number four, what does Jesus teach us in this experience? He teaches us that servants serve imperfect people because that's the only kind of people that there are, imperfect people. Because we serve imperfect people, that causes us to face disappointment when we serve, because they're gonna let you down sometimes. Because we serve imperfect people, that causes us to face sometimes deep hurt and pain as we serve, because they might even reject the way that you're trying to serve. And Jesus shows us in the way that he served the disciples that we all are called to serve imperfect people. I mean, Jesus was serving imperfect people when he washed these feet. Let's just go through the list together. First, the whole group, he washed the disciples' feet. These were the disciples that walked into the room that night and started with an argument. They come into the room and they start arguing about who's the greatest, Luke 22, 24, there in your outline. A dispute arose among them as to which one was considered to be the greatest. This is happening that night, that very night. When Jesus walks into that room, maybe the picture you have of the upper room where they had the Last Supper, maybe the picture you have isn't quite the picture of what really happened. Like it's this worshipful place with hushed towns and everybody really is focusing in on Jesus. That's not how it was at all. We get our, our, our picture from da Vinci's painting. It wasn't like they like, hey guys, all line up on one side so I can take the picture. It wasn't like that at all. They, they were reclined around this table, but when they came in, It wasn't a quiet, holy place. There was this argument going on because they thought Jesus had come into Jerusalem to take the kingdom. They thought he was gonna be king in a few days. And they were arguing about who was gonna sit beside him on the throne. And Jesus, knowing he's gonna die the next day, walks into this. How would you feel? He spent three years with these guys. He talked to them again and again about service. And he walks in the last night he's gonna be with them and they still haven't gotten it. I'd be tempted to go, forget it. I I mean, three years with you? I mean, really, three years with Jesus and you couldn't get it? How in the world are you gonna get it? But instead, he serves them. He served people who were imperfect. Truth of the matter is, people will disappoint you as you serve. But that's not why you're serving, for their affirmation. 
You're serving because of God's love for you and the difference it can make in somebody else's life. People will disappoint you, but you can choose to keep serving. Don't let that disappointment steal from you the greatness of serving others. When you think about who, whose feet Jesus washed that night, he washed Judas' feet. He washed the feet of the one who was gonna betray him. John 13, 2, that evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. So Judas knew he was gonna betray Jesus and Jesus knew that Judas was gonna betray Jesus and he's washing his feet. The whole meal is an appeal to Judas. He washes his feet, he sits beside him, he dips his hand in the bowl with him, but Judas decides to betray him. He fails Jesus and still Jesus serves him. People will fail you, but you can keep serving people. And don't let the fact that somebody has failed you as you serve them steal from you, take away from you the joy of serving. I know a lot of people, somebody's failed them and they just backed off. They go, I'll just keep coming to church, but no more serving. I don't want to be hurt again. Well, maybe, just maybe you were trying to get too much identity from them. Or maybe the hurt that they brought into your life needed some time for healing. And maybe that time has passed. And now it's time to get serving again because that's where true greatness is found. He washed Judas's feet. He also washed Peter's feet. Even though Peter told him not to, he washed Peter's feet. He comes to Peter and no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. You gotta love Peter. I mean, he just goes from no to absolutely yes. He's just like anything or everything. None of the other disciples, we don't know what they were thinking. We know what Peter was thinking because you always knew what Peter was thinking. Like some of your relatives at Thanksgiving this next week, you know what I'm talking about. You always know what they're thinking. And he thought, I can't let Jesus do this. And Jesus says, you have to let me do this. Peter is so human. He says, you shall never wash my feet, but Jesus does. And he says, I would never deny you, Lord. But he denies him three times. I'm glad he's in the disciples because he represents all of us. He is so sure and yet he's so wrong and yet he's still so loved by God. And that's true of every one of us. People will tell you sometimes they don't need to be served. Serve them anyway. That's what Jesus did with Peter. He just kept serving no matter what. No matter what people said, no matter what people were gonna do, what they had done, he just kept serving. Servants serve imperfect people. And there's one final thing we learned from Jesus that night, maybe the most important thing. Number five, servants are humble. Servants are humble. The Greek word for humility means to stoop low. And that's literally what Jesus did. He, He stooped low, he got down, and he washed their feet. And if I'm gonna be the kind of servant that really sees God at work in my life and through my life, humility is one of the keys. Washing feet in Jesus' day, it wasn't some showy ceremony, it was a menial task. And Jesus humbly chose to serve, to meet the need. The next day, he chose humbly to go to the cross to meet the need for forgiveness. A couple of weeks ago, we were talking about worship. And Pastor Rick asked a question that caught me. He asked, what kind of worship does God love? Anybody remember the answer, by the way? What kind of worship does God love? Wholehearted worship. Rick's gonna be so glad you remembered that two weeks later. I'm telling you, that's gonna get him out of a sick bed right away. I mean, that's the best thing in the world that you remembered it two weeks later. That that question, it just caught my attention. So I thought we'd ask the same question with ministry. What kind of ministry does God love? Write this in with me. Humble ministry. Humble ministry. Here's what Jesus had to say about that. The greatest among you will be your servant. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The greatest servants know the greatest barrier to the meeting of needs, to serving. It's my proud heart. It's not proud hearts. It's not our proud hearts. It's my proud heart. 
And you're gonna have to deal with God on your own about that, but I know about my proud heart. I know how I can focus on what other people think about me rather than serving them out of God's love for me. I know about my proud heart. I know I can focus on how it's gonna make me feel about myself rather than knowing God loves me and just serving out of that. My proud heart. If you're gonna really be a great servant, you're gonna have to deal continually in your life with this issue of pride. And the answer to that is humility. C.S. Lewis once said, if anyone anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell them the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. We already talked about who you are in Jesus Christ. So humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking more of others. And it's valuing them by serving them. Been in Rwanda the last couple of weeks, I I was reminded of an experience I had a few years ago. I'd gone up to uh, the north of the country to an area that was pretty rural. And I went up to be with a group of about eight pastors. And we were gonna be together and I was gonna teach them all day. It was just me and them and and a translator. And I decided to talk to them about love because I'd been studying love before I went into that. So we just talked together about love all day. We'd talk about what it was and then a rainstorm would come along and beat against the metal roof and we'd just be quiet for a while because no one could hear each other. Then the rainstorm would pass and we'd talk some more about love. About halfway through the day, I looked at these guys and I just felt the deepest love for them because they don't have much education. They, they, They don't have much materially. They were all bivocational pastors. They worked hard all week long and they wrote their sermons at night. They went and saw people in the hospital in the weekend or at night. And I just thought of how much they had sacrificed to be able to serve the people that they were serving. And the thought came to me that when we get to heaven, it would be my greatest joy if heaven was just being able to serve these men some tea. Because being able to do some small act of service for them would bring the greatest joy to me because I know what they have done for God. When you think of service, when you think of humility, don't think of it as something being taken from your life. Anytime you serve, it's something that's being given into your life, the smallest act of service. So put yourself in the place of the disciples. Jesus has just washed your feet. Maybe you're feeling a little little embarrassed Maybe you're feeling a little confused. Why is he doing this? And now Jesus has something to say. He did it because of the dirty feet, but he also has something to say. So in the place of the disciples, just take in for these next few moments what he has to say to you. When he'd finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example so that you should do as I've done for you. Wash one another's feet. He's talking about serving the need. When they walked into that room, that upper room that night, everything was there, prepared for someone to serve. The pitcher of water was there, the wash basin was there, the linen cloth was there. It just took somebody to take it up and begin to serve. So the question is, this next week, what's God gonna ask you to take up? What need is gonna come into your view and you say, oh, I can do that one, and you, you take it up? This next week, I can promise you this, you're gonna meet some people who have dirty feet without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, Maybe physically, but certainly spiritually, certainly emotionally. You're going to meet some people who have dirty feet. And God's going to ask you to take up a towel, spiritually, figuratively, and serve them. And some of them are going to be the people around your Thanksgiving table that you see once a year. You don't want to see them once a year. You don't even want to talk to them. And God's going to ask you to serve them this next week. And you're thinking right now, don't even say that to me. You just ruined my Thanksgiving. But your small act of service towards them, that might be the greatest thing you've ever done for your family. Might be the greatest thing they've ever had done. Greatness is found in service. That's where it's found. The greatest blessings in your life, they come in those places that you choose to serve others. 
And humble service is the road to genuine, true greatness. Jesus comes and he says, I want to turn your thinking entirely, completely upside down. In a world where we think that greatness is about being noticed, Jesus says it's about noticing other people. In a world where we think that greatness is about what we get, Jesus says it's about what you give. In a world where we think that greatness is about what I achieve, Jesus says greatness, real greatness, comes from serving. Significance comes from service. Blessings, the greatest blessings in your life are gonna come from serving. That's what Jesus said at the end of this discussion with his disciples, John 13, 17. Now that you know these things, Jesus says, you'll be blessed if you do them. That's God's call to me, that's God's call to you this next week. Now that you know these things, that we've gone through it, seen what Jesus exemplified for us, Jesus says, you're gonna be blessed if you do something about it. So as we close, picture yourself in that upper room. Visualize for a moment that Jesus is washing your feet. What's your attitude? Maybe it's guilt. Then you need to receive his forgiveness. That's why he died on the cross. And you can say to him right now, Jesus Christ, I receive the forgiveness and life that only you give. It's life changing, it's life transforming. It's a simple prayer because he already did everything that's necessary to give you the gift of forgiveness and life. Maybe your feeling as he's washing your feet is, I'm just unworthy. Well, who wouldn't feel unworthy? You need to reacquaint yourself with grace, the great gift of God's love in your life. Yes, we're unworthy, but God has gifted. He's graced unworthy people with his love. You know how he wants you to feel as you sense that he serves you, that he's washing your feet? He told us at the beginning because he loved his own. He wants you to feel loved. When you sense the depth of his love for you, then it empowers, it strengthens you to love the people in your life. I need some strength to do that. I don't know about you. So let's call upon him for it. Let's ask him for it as we end this time together. Would you pray with me? And in prayer, just say, Jesus Christ, I want to live a great life. And you've shown me some things here. That greatness may be in some other places than I thought it was. So teach me, show me, help me to learn. The rest of my life, this is a lifetime project the greatness of what it means to serve. Help me to serve others in love. Help me to serve others no matter what, knowing who I am because of who you are. And Jesus, give me the humility to choose to serve in even the most difficult of circumstances. I can't do this alone, I need your strength. And so I ask for your strength. In your name I ask it, amen, amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online pastor. I wanna invite you to take your next step by checking out our online community or help get you connected to a local Saddleback campus. Three things we have to offer you right now. First, learn more about belonging to a church family by taking class 101. Second, don't live life alone and get into community with others by joining an online small group or a local home group in your area. Third. Join our Facebook group to be more engaged with our online community throughout the week. Take your next step and learn where a local campus is near you by visiting saddleback.com slash online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.